Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the next session in the Black Swan series. So thank you all for coming. It's great to see you all. And I'm happy to see that we have people from a wide range of locations, you know, as far afield as Argentina, I see. So really great to see everyone. So just to let everybody know, this session is going to be done three times today. This is the one in English, then later we'll be doing it in French and then again in Spanish. So it's uh, an exercise for those of you who wanted to you know, polish up uh, your foreign language skills or just get a chance to see how things shift when you start using one language as compared to another. But this session is going to be a both a sort of recap of earlier sessions, but also something new in and of itself, because it's going to introduce the next phase of the project. In fact, rather than a recap, I would like to view it as an integration of what was said in earlier sessions with what's to come next. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. And I'll show you what I mean. So here we go. All right, so let me make some slight changes here. There we go. And please feel free to type questions into the chat as we go along. I also want to make sure that you know, we, this is not just me talking at you, but also give you a chance to ask questions uh, and you know, relate this to what you want to do. Because as we're going to see the question of how people can make use of these sessions on Black Swan thinking is going to be at the forefront of what we do. All right. So as I said, this is a question of thinking about Black Swan. So the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure that we get very clear in our minds what a Black Swan is. So aside from this lovely critter right here, when we're talking about the black swan, we're talking about an event that has three key features. The first one is it cannot be predicted ahead of time. The second one is that it has a major effect on whatever it is that you're doing. And the third one is that while you can't predict it ahead of time, you can rationalize it retrospectively. Now, this right off the bat separates true black swan events from other types of events. So since Tom Ames from Texas is in the chat, I'll mention that the uh, cold snap that hit Texas a little while back and that produced a major crisis in terms of energy generation in the state and then subsequently uh, availability of potable water, et cetera, was not a black swan. Why wasn't it a black swan? Because it fell within a category of events that was statistically predictable. In other words, uh, Texas is known to have roughly every 25 years a deep cold snap like that. And in fact, 10 years ago had had a cold snap that there had already been a warning about. So we're not talking about events that are statistically rare, but fall within ranges of predictability. We're talking about events that cannot be predicted ahead of time. So a true black swan is something that you say, huh, that's something I wasn't expecting. So for instance, in the context of Texas, the fact that the cold snap occurred was not something that could be could not have been predicted ahead of time, it was predictable statistically, but the fact that some changes that have been mandated or recommended uh, a decade ago had not been put in place are closer to black swan events. So this is important to realize that a true black swan does not even have statistical predictability. And the other aspect about this that I want to emphasize is the aspect of retrospective rationality. In other words, you can say, oh yes, all those pieces happened or failed together, or all those uh, different uh, domino pieces toppled because of X, Y, and Z, but there was no way that you would have known ahead of time that X, Y, and Z would cause each other to topple, each other to fall over. So you can figure out what happened afterwards, but you can't predict it ahead of time. So this is a true black swan. Now, black swan thinking is of course designed with this type of event in mind, but it's also important to realize that black swan thinking can be extended to events that do look more like what happened in Texas with the cold snap. In other words, you can go from black swans 
do what are known as dragon kings, which are not statistically completely predictable, but have some connection to statistically predictable events, and eventually find your way all the way to statistically rare, but nonetheless predictable events. So it's important to realize that while black swan events themselves are very, very specific, black swan thinking or thinking about how to deal with black swans extends to a, a broader range of scenarios, a broader range of circumstances. Now, why do we care? Why do we care about black swans? Well, we care about black swans because this diagram here shows you what happens. You've got business as usual happening the way it always does. So you're just going along, doing whatever you do. And since most of you are educators, I'll assume you're working in education. But in addition to that, one of the things then that happens is that a black swan event happens, a black swan event takes place, and lo and behold, now things are no longer business as usual because your business as usual enters the dark cloud of the black swan event. And three major outcomes that people think about happen. And there's a fourth that we'll see is the one that you would like to see happen, but it's unlikely to happen unless you've been doing your homework in terms of black swan thinking. The three scenarios that happen most frequently are the following. Most of the time, you get that third scenario down from the top, which is what's sometimes called near-term risk. So you go through the black swan event and you emerge the other end, somewhat damaged, somewhat battered. You've taken a beating. If, it, if you're, say, an education institution, you may have lost some students. Maybe some research is no longer uh, available because it, you, know, you lost researchers. Maybe your finances are in worse shape than they were before but you don't think you're going to go completely away. So this is a near-term risk. You're damaged, but you've made it out the other end. On either end of either side of that, you have two possibilities. One possibility is what's sometimes called existential risk. That's very simple. It's where you take a battering and you're down for the count and that's it. You're not getting up again. So you're a university, you've lost too much funding to keep on going. Uh, you are a K-12 institution, your district is going to have to be completely rearranged and you as a school, as a school are uh, no longer going to be viable in that new arrangement. Uh, you're teaching a course and you have to scrap the course completely or your students all fail and cannot move on to the next subject because it just plummeted and did not work. That's existential risk. That's when you go through a black swan event and you come out not just a little bit the worse or somewhat the worse for it, you come out so much the worse that you disappear, you vanish. At the other end of this, you come out with what sometimes are usually called resilience. Resilience means that you come out the other end saying, whew, we made it through that. And you're pretty much in the same shape as you were before, but you have been somewhat changed by the process. So you're not quite back to business as usual, but you are not so damaged or you're not severely damaged and you've come out in pretty much the same shape you were before. Now, these are the three outcomes that most people uh, discuss most of the time, but the fourth outcome is the one we're going to be targeting with black swan thinking. And the one we're targeting with black swan thinking is anti-fragility. And anti-fragility, was defined by the same person who defined the black swan event, Nassim Taleb, as being the type of scenario where you go through a black swan event and you come out better than you went in. Now, this is the one that people say, whoa, wait a second, how is that possible? I mean, I go through one of these events and I come out stronger or better. Well, you know, Tom just posted, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Frankly, most of the time, what happens is one of the other three scenarios but anti-fragility is the case where, in fact, you do come out better out the other end. So what you need to do is, as we're going to see, use black swan thinking to plan to develop the necessary infrastructure, the necessary changes to your organization or your course or how learning is structured at your institution so you come out stronger at the other end. Now, this is the place at which people just frankly stop and say, I'm sorry, but I don't get it. If you knew how to make things better, why would you have made things better before the black swan, number one? And number two, how can you come out better out of an event like this? 
And Tom is saying his classes are better now than they were before the pandemic, which tells me he was doing his homework and doing some good black swan thinking. But let me show you an analogy that I find helps illustrate how and why anti-fragility can and does work. And the analogy is this. So this is a painting by Thomas Aikens, and it's called The Gross Surgery. Gross because of the name of the head of the surgery, uh, Dr. Gross. And it shows something that was very rare when uh, Aikens was painting uh, this portrait of Gross, which is here he shows Gross operating on a patient with an infected femur and saying, okay, uh, we're not going to chop off this person's leg. We're actually going to rescue the leg. Now, that was an amazing development, all right? That was completely unheard of. It's kind of, whoa, you're going to do what? You, no, you would, you, we just chop it off and that's it. So you can think of that as somewhere between the sort of type of you know, short-term or near-term risk and existential risk in terms of the leg. But what he was doing was saying, no, let, let's see if we can recover this leg with surgery by just treating the bone rather than chopping off the whole leg. But this also provides us the element for saying, well, if he managed to recover the leg and the person could still walk well afterwards, this would have been resilience. But here's the thing. If he had gone into that surgery, looked in at the leg after opening up and said, wait, there's another problem here. Say there's something along the lines of a tumor information and then had removed the tumor, he might have been actually had been able to have that patient come out walking better than they did before with better life expectancy than they had before. And this is what I say is the analog to black swan events. You don't go into surgery just because. You don't show up one fine day at your local hospital, at least most people don't, and say, you know what, I kind of feel like being opened up. So why don't you chop me open and see if there's anything you can tweak inside me uh, to make things better. Now, you, you do it because there's a crisis, because there's a major reason, et cetera. So you open up. But in the process of opening up, you suddenly say, well, while I'm here, I might as well look for things that aren't working, things that could need to be fixed, things that could work better, so that I don't just come out the other end with, well, that was about it. But you say, what could have been improved? What can I see now because of the surgery? Uh, that I couldn't see before? What could I see now that would have been invisible to me before? And that's exactly it. Black Swan events make visible things that you couldn't see before. You didn't necessarily want them, just like you didn't want to go under the blade, but at the same time, it does make that possible. It does make it available to you. So again, if you're curious as to what Tom is doing, Paul has now just posted a couple of a, a link in the chat so you can see more about that. So that's what we're looking at. And that's why anti-fragile thinking is, is possible. But just like a surgeon needs to be prepared for, well, whatever they're going to encounter, but doesn't necessarily know ahead of time what they're going to encounter. So we need to prep the stage for anti-fragile thinking. And now I'm going to talk about, okay, so anti-fragility is a huge topic. I'm going to assume that most of you come from academic institutions. That's what I saw in introductions, in the chat, in uh, you know, the list of registrants I saw before. So I'm not going to be talking, for instance, about anti-fragility in banking, although it is a fascinating topic. I'm not going to be talking about anti-fragility in energy systems, although given what happened in Texas, maybe I should. But I'm going to be talking about anti-fragility specifically in the context of thinking about education. And there are many, many ways I could look at this. But here I have five questions that I'll come back to at the end of today's talk that I want to present to you. So the first one is the most atomic. How do I make this unit of instruction anti-fragile? How do I make a course anti-fragile? How do I make a degree anti-fragile? How do I make an institution anti-fragile? That's a progressively greater scale. And you're going to say, well, there are intermediate stages. Absolutely. I'm just trying to hit sort of highlights. But ultimately, behind all of these, and essentially, one of the key questions you want to be asking over and over again, both in and of itself, perhaps, but also in the context of the other ones, is how do I make this student learning anti-fragile? Because there's no point in making an institution anti-fragile if what the students get out of it is not anti-fragile. I've actually seen this happen, where an institution says, we made it through, and the answer is yes, but none of your students did. So it's a very short-term uh, lived success. And unfortunately, what you don't realize is you just went into existential risk because all of your students are now out the door and will never, ever, ever be back again 
because they found that their learning was not anti-fragile. Sad, but true, and does happen. Okay, so keep these questions in mind as we're going through this, because this is how I'm going to focus the rest of today's talk in terms of setting the stage for this type of work. And as we're going to see, the next phase of the Black Swan project is going to be intimately concerned with this type of work. All right. So the first thing we need to do is, if you saw me in that first diagram, I had all those clouds and they were nice puffy clouds, but they were opaque clouds. We need to take apart that cloud. We need to look inside the cloud. That business as, as usual, I can't just take business as usual as this big monolithic thing and make it anti-fragile. Sorry, won't work. I need to tease it apart. And it turns out there are three components that I can use to tease apart. I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of these in turn, in terms of not just generic, but specifically in the world of education. System dynamics, which is the big picture approach. How things, which may be cash in the case of an institution's survival, it may be learning, it may be research products, many, many different things. We're going to see some examples are flowing between groups, between uh, organizations or subgroupings within your overall organization. Agents, which deals with how individuals can start doing things on their own, can start participating or not participating in groups, interacting in ways that shift what's going on. And finally, networks that deals with the connections between those individuals. And again, we'll spend, spend a little bit more time with each of these. So let me take them one at a time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an example from within the world of education so that you can start seeing why this is relevant and how to apply it to anti-fragile design in education. We're also going to see an additional tool that we're going to use throughout in the next stage of the Black Swan project. And that's a model that I've developed called the SAMR model, which allows you to relate the way in which you use a technology to the impact that the technology has on student learning. And the second model, which is the EdTech Quintet, which refers to five categories of educational practices using technological tools that are of greatest relevance, greatest power in the world of education. We're going to see how these two fit together, as I've shown you here, like a jigsaw, in a way to give you the pieces that you need to construct anti-fragile thinking in terms of education. So let's go first to system dynamics. Now, there have been already three sessions on this. All of these are recorded. We're going to send you, among other things, the information on how to view the recording of this session, but we also have the information on how to access all the previous sessions. And this is the first one. This sketch note, by the way, was done by the amazing Torina Branson, who does amazing, amazing work in terms of summarizing visually what you're talking about. So this is something that, again, you'll be able to look at at your leisure and summarizes the topics that we covered in that first session. But the key element that you want to be thinking about in system dynamics is, as you see in the corner, bathtubs. And if you've already heard me talk about this, sorry, you're going to hear me one more time. Say so you can always think of system dynamics as bathtubs connected by pipes. And those bathtubs contain something. And the something depends, as I say, on what it is you're looking at. And the pipes have flows which connect the, the tubs and tells you if this tub is full or empty or getting full or getting empty. Is it going to overflow and make a nasty mess on the floor? You generally don't want that, generally. Uh, maybe if you're a duck living in your home, you do want the uh, bathtub to overflow and make an SMS. But other than that, you generally don't want that. Your neighbors downstairs, if you live in an apartment, get very upset, etc. So it's important to figure out how different ways that tubs are connected, how different feedback loops that tell a pipe to open or close, etc., are connected. And this metaphor works very well. But let me give you an example in education that I haven't shown yet. Because as I say, if you've seen the video of this session or participated in it, you know, I talk a lot about bathtubs and other examples like that. But let's talk, for instance, about a model that says, let's think about learning and groups of learners and events that happen and elements such as learners' concepts, etc. as just that, bathtubs or uh, stocks connected by pipes or called flows. And this is from a Diana Lorillard's work on formal and informal learning. And what you see here is how different elements can be viewed as stocks connected by flows. 
So for instance, if you go, let's just look at a couple of examples. So you have go to formal learning here at the top, you have teachers concepts and learners concepts. Each of those can be viewed as a stock and they're connected by pipes such as concepts and they're, there's a feedback loop provided by questions. In other words, you could go through and you could say, if I'm looking at my class, for instance, let's assume you're staying on the level of an individual class and I want to understand how different elements, how different components are being transacted between students, learners, teachers, etc. I can view this as a stock and flow diagram and say, well, okay, suppose something hits hard. How do I make sure that this doesn't all fall apart? How do I make sure perhaps that students can refocus their questions that might be a topic of interest to me to deal with a shift such as provoked by a black swan type event in the context right now of the current COVID pandemic, certainly something that black swan thinking would definitely help with and has helped many people with. This is the sort of thing you might want to do because some people say, well, it's relevant, it's got, hold on, it, there's something deeper going on here. The world is changing because of the pandemic. Wouldn't I want my students' questions to become better questions relative to the world they will be inhabiting post pandemic. Brian Alexander has just posted a link to a conversation with Diana Lorillard. I strongly recommend that. I was fortunately able to take part in it and Diana's a wonderful uh, thinker and speaker. So by all means, look at that. So this is an example of a model that says, okay, so we have the stocks and flows, but there's one more thing. So it's kind of, okay, so this is very abstract. What type of things are being transacted? And again, this is something that if you were looking at doing a project, on this topic, you might say, well, you know, each of these pipes, each of these questions, etc., falls within a set of learning types. And uh, Diana has these six learning types, which you know, if you choose to work in this, in the next phase of the Black Swan project, I'll have much more to say about. But these six categories, acquisition, inquiry, discussion, collaboration, practice, and production, all describe a type of activity that can take place between students or by students or between students and teachers, and that can shape, tell us what is, what's that sort of thing that's going through the pipes in that diagram. So this is a systems approach, a system dynamics approach to thinking about what's going on in a classroom, in a learning organization. You'll notice if, I, if you go, were to go back to the previous slide, that you also have informal learning. And again, that's crucial. One of the things we've seen during the pandemic is that informal learning has become an essential component, even for students or for teachers who didn't use it before. And it's also become much more visible how many people were using it before, but it was sort of under the radar. And again, if you understand how to leverage that, if you wanna get something that works better, is anti-fragile after this pandemic or whatever next black swan event hits, for instance, climate change, which is going to generate as we know, a series of one black swan after another, after another, then you really want to be thinking about that aspect or that component uh, here. So, all right. So this is the first one of the three. Now, the second one, and again, you've got the tape for this, if you watch it, is agents. And what do you do is you take that bathtub with the pipes and the one you say, what if each drop of water had a mind of its own? What if each drop of water could sort of decide to go walking off to the next uh, bathtub and do something else? What if a drop of water could decide to walk back up the pipe? What if a, stop, a drop of water could say, hey, I'm gonna make my own mini bathtub over here? All sorts of things like that. So in agents, you're starting to say, well, you have still the big picture of the system, but then there are individual components. Now, a purist, a mathematical purist would tell you, ah, but you can always take an agent diagram and re-render it as uh, a pure system dynamics diagram? Yes, but it gets pretty convoluted to try to think that way. It's much easier to think about saying, what if you could break out those components? So right now we're just thinking of them as independent agents, independent variables. And again, you can watch the video, for example, see how to connect this to the bigger system dynamics picture. But as I did before, let's think about, for instance, what happens if you're looking at the scale of a classroom? And now let me give you another example. So I showed you Lorillard as a big system dynamics, but now let's go a little bit more micro on this because that's after all what you're doing with agents. Suppose you're talking about the feedback loops are involved in formative assessment. Okay, first things first, 
you need a working definition for formative assessment. And this is saved from the work of Black and William. And you'll see that it says practice in the classroom is formative to the extent that evidence about student achievement is listed, interpreted, and used. Three things, okay? You pull it from wherever you're getting it, you interpret it, you make meaning of it, and you use it by who? Teachers, learners, or their peers. Again, three groups here involved. And then you're going to use it not just because, huh, that was interesting. Okay, great. And now we're going to sit back or I'm going to just go give the student a grade and that's it. For a start, if it's a grade that's summative, not formative assessment, but uh, some people just decide that all they're going to do with formative is translated and go Shazam and Shazam makes it into formative assessment, which is not a good idea. Uh, but what is it that if you're going to really be using formative assessment, you're making decisions about the next steps in instruction are likely to be better or better founded than what they would have done had that evidence that was elicited was not there. So that's a definition for formative assessment. Why is this something that leads us to agent theory? Because notice that we have three groups here, teachers, learners, and peers, but wait, each learner is now an individual aid entity and agent within this panorama. It isn't just a, you don't provide formative assessment to the class as a bulk, then you just be provided to the peer group but not to the individual learner. It isn't just the learner or the peers that use it, the teacher better be using it to change how instruction. So there is also the teacher or teachers plural, if there are more, more, it's more an instructor or one more, more than one teacher involved either in the course or maybe a department or maybe a whole institution. So they're also operating as agents. They have individual agents. And if you look, for instance, at the work that Dylan William has done to build up on this, Dylan Williams says, okay, let's take these three groups, the teacher and the learner, which are both agents, and then the peer, which you can view as this larger pool of group, right? And then you have, so where's the learner going? Where is the learner right now? And how do you get there? And identifies a total of five key categories of activities involving formative assessment that do this. But now you can take this and you can say, hey, I can use agent theory to help me because I can see how the different pieces, how these five different activities, each has a different relationship to the agents. I can see that peer group and I can bring in some of my knowledge from system dynamics to better understand how that peer group interacts with teacher, interacts with learner, et cetera, and has some internal structure. And then I can say, how do I balance this? Not just because I'm saying, you know, some people will say, well, I'm just gonna cherry pick. Let's see, I'm gonna pick one of column number two and one of column number five here. That's better than not doing it at all. But if you want anti-fragile design, you need to figure out how is an agent, that learner, going to be interacting with a peer group when say, oh, I don't know, why would I say this? The peer group went into the cloud. The peer group is now no longer face-to-face. -face. The peer group is only available from nine to 10 when everybody's on the Zoom chat. Or maybe we need to create async opportunities to provide some of this. How would I create anti-fragility that leverages that agent capability and leverages it in a meaningful manner. Because if nobody can use this, then not only is this anti-fragile, I can guarantee you, you're going for at least short-term risk and not unlikely existential risk. I'm already seeing this, sadly, but I am seeing this in some departments that said, oh, we'll just keep on doing assessment the same way we did all along, did not apply anti-fragile thinking. And therefore the whole thing falls apart because the elements over here are not present. Uh, I see a comment here from Paul, uh, says uh, four or five seem to take us into the area of teacher, trainer, learners, all interacting as co-conspirators and learners. Is that one step towards building anti-fragility and lifelong learning? Absolutely, Paul, thank you, perfect. Wonderful, beautiful. Everybody, copy down that sentence from Paul. That's a great way to look at it, and that's exactly right. Because this goes back to that fifth element I said, you know, keep thinking about how, does, how do you make my student learning anti-fragile? Bingo, exactly what Paul just said and exactly why this at the agent level is important. All right, so thank you, Paul. I'll write you the check letter. Uh, so what's next? Well, the third element is networks because these agents are not just each one a little drop of water all by itself that you know animated. I, I now have a kind of 1950s Disney animation model in my head of the little drop of water walking around and you know, running on a film loop maybe, or one of those, you know, for those of you who are um, like myself of a certain age and can remember loading up the Bell and Howell projector 
uh, with the eight millimeter or 16 millimeter uh, film and having the welcome to the world of water introduction. Okay, so think of that, but now they're not those individual little drops of water. They are connected with, to each other. They are in a network with each other because there are relationships, there are connections. And there aren't just connections between you and the other students and the other faculty, etc. There are also connections among the elements that you use. So there are connections, for instance, as we'll see among things like the books in a class. There are connections between different classes. There are even implicit connections, which I'll show you in a second. So this is the next level, because after all, it isn't just every drop of water wandering around on its own. It's how are these drops of water connected with other things that are not water, such as little pipelets and so on, and how are those connected with each other, and how are all the pipes connected to each other? This is an idea of a network that's also here. So let's look at a couple of examples. Here I'm going to show you several. Here's the first one I'm going to show you. You introduce an innovation in your class. Why are you introducing an innovation? Because something changed. Again, guess what? COVID said, hey, guys, you know what? Uh, not so good uh, to cram everybody together into a big lecture hall and just uh, pack everybody together with less than six feet between them and no masks. Uh, not a great idea. So suddenly change. And you have to think about, well, I'm going to innovate. I'm going to introduce a new way of teaching, a new way of talking to my students, et cetera. Great. And then faculty do this and say, oh, my students are so reactionary, man. They don't accept any innovation. They, are, they just want to go back and say, hold on. If there's one thing we know from the work of Rogers and others is that innovation propagates through a group by virtue of different social elements that, yes, are connected to each other through networks. So you start out with the innovators, the people who are out at the front and who can immediately pounce on a new idea and do something with it, but their, their ideas are very different from the rest of the group. So the opinion leaders uh, are the ones that see the innovators and say, ah, I know how to translate this into something the rest of the group can use. And they themselves also innovate and find new things, but their goals, their ideas are more like the rest of the group. They have the early majority that says, we think we're connected to the opinion leaders. Therefore, we will follow them. The late majority says, we're kind of connected to the early majority, but we kind of look at the rest of the group out there. And when everybody else is going, sure, we'll go next. And then you have the laggards who never, innovate, okay? So if you want your learning and this great innovation that you came up with so that your students could keep on going through the pandemic to propagate, well, you'd better think about how innovation is going to propagate and you'd better have done this before the pandemic because once you're in the middle of the pandemic, it's too damn late to figure out how this works in your type of student groups. And again, I've seen this happen over and over again. And it's important because if you can do this work ahead of time, you build anti-fragility in. And just to show you that I'm not making this up, let me show you one example. So this is for a propagation of innovation. In this particular case, it was uh, learning new ways of teaching math and new ways of communicating math and propagating through a group of schools as mediated by the school principals and superintendents that uh, pushed for the innovation. And what you're going to see here is, here's the network diagram showing you the connections among people from the very first innovator, who you'll notice is not strongly connected to anybody else by ties of communication or friendship, but then you see it propagate and guess what? you see exactly this type of structure. If layer two, those opinion leaders in 1959 had not been connected and you did nothing to ensure that what they discovered was communicated to others, the innovation would not propagate. And you can do analyses like this in your class. It's actually much easier than you might think. So that's an example. Some of you uh, who were with me for a session I did before the Black Swan project officially began, will remember that I told you to take the constellation of books that form the connections between classes and use that not just to see the connections among uh, classes, but also to say, hey, if I wanted to have the whole structure fall apart, what books would I remove to do this? Well, while generally you don't want the whole structure to fall apart, that type of thinking leads to anti-fragile design because it allows you to see which books do I need, which books connect things and watch out. Sometimes you don't want strong connections all the time. I'll refer to the work of Granovetter on the importance of weak connections in networks for, for the overall uh, capacity of the network to survive events like black swans. But the books themselves are connecting different classes, different courses, different learners, 
and it's important to view them as such. So that's another example of a network that might be of use to you if you're building an anti-fragile thinking in what you do. And finally, sometimes you have with our implicit networks. Now I had thought of doing this as an activity here, but it would have taken too long. So I decided, no, nah, let's scrap it and uh, just keep going without it. This is the result of a project that I did recently where we asked a community of education leaders in K-12 a series of questions. In particular, we asked them seven questions about uses of technology, and we asked them to rank them on a five-point uh, Likert scale from uh, strongly agree that this is useful to strongly disagree that this is useful. And then I was able to say, well, if you agree on all seven points with somebody, there's an implicit link between the two of you. If you agree on, say, five, it's a weaker link. If they agree on only three, it's a much weaker link. If you agree on none, there's no link between them. So here I'm showing you, this is an actual research result. It is anonymized, so you don't know who these people are. But you can see right away that this is a rather interesting network. And in particular, if you do the network analysis, you see there are three communities. And if I were to get into the detailed analysis, which I will not for this, but just to give you the general idea, one of the communities, the one you see in yellow, it tends to be much more positive towards general applications of technology. The green community tends to be sort of in between, not completely hot, not completely cold. The blue community isn't cold, but it's more skeptical of some uses of technology. And I can say, aha, this is useful. This is important. Even though none of these people knew each other prior to the workshop where this data was collected, I still have something important and useful I can get out of it because there is an implicit network and I could start saying, well, suppose I want to put together teams that are very strongly positive towards technology in the entire team. Then I'm going to draw from the yellow side of things. But suppose I'm going to put together a team that's a mix. Then I'm going to say, I want to make sure I have some people from yellow, some people from green, some people from blue. Suppose I want somebody that can talk with a lot of different people. I'm going to say, well, look at somebody like, a, you know, number four smack dab in the middle of the diagram. They're talking with people they have some similarities with people in the yellow group, some similarities with people in the blue group, and of course, some similarities with people in the green group. So they're a good bridge. And I can start using this. And again, this is one example, but I can use this type of implicit uh, type of connections, this implicit type of network to help me define, determine, for instance, anti-fragile solutions for an institution. Because one of the things I can tell you is when a black swan like COVID hits, the last thing you want to be doing generally is say, yeah, let's go to a traditional departmental structure. And boy, that'll be a great structure for dealing with this crisis in a way that's strong. If you're lucky, you're going to have departments that all are very well uh, structured, et cetera, but they're going to have those departments. The emergence of a solution that works for the institution in anti-fragile fashion is extremely unlikely. At best, you're going to get resilience. And again, let me tell you, even that is rare. So again, this type of implicit network and thinking about how to look for this type of implicit network, what to do uh, in terms of uh, fostering certain types of networks using the results, et cetera, is what you're seeing then as another possible use. A quick comment here from Tom in the chat, which he has just listed an excellent link to a study of communities of practice and faculty innovation. Again, important one if you're thinking about what might you do with this, what could you do with this, and why. All right. So those are the three tiers that allow you to unpack what's going on inside one of these systems, what's going on inside one of these uh, scenarios that allow you to start saying, how do I craft anti-fragile solutions? How do I look at those bathtubs and pipes in such a way that the bathtub doesn't overflow in such a way that the water keeps going through the system? How do I look at the agents to make sure that agents don't drop out, don't disappear? How do I look at the networks to make sure that the network pushes in the direction I want it to go rather than tearing the whole thing apart? And in this context then, uh, one of the things that I found is useful is a model I developed called SAMR. Some of you will be familiar with it, but very briefly, it relates the type of use that you make of technology to the type of impact uh, that the technology has on student learning. 
So at the lowest level, which is substitution, you're just using a technology to do the same thing as an older technology, no changes in what you're doing. And that has a very low impact on student uh, learning, almost negligible. At the augmentation level, uh, you're starting to include functional improvements. That means you're doing exactly the same task, but you're doing it better using the new technology, using new affordances made possible by technology that weren't uh, available before. And that's the augmentation level, which is an improvement level. So these two levels, however, have relatively low impact on student uh, outcomes, and they're what I call the enhancement levels. The two top levels have a much greater impact on student outcomes. They're what I call the transformation levels. At modification, not only do you improve the same task, but you actually start to change it. You make the task itself better by virtue of what the technology brings to the table. It, you make it better by virtue of what you can do with it that you couldn't do otherwise, even as the task remains the same. And at the redefinition level, you start to create a new task altogether that replaces an old task in part or in whole, but that you couldn't have done at all without the new technology. And those are the transformation levels which have much greater impact on student outcomes. So as uh, we're going to see in the next phase of the Black Swan project, one of the things that we'll be doing is we'll be working in teams on thinking how to use this to help you look at system dynamics, at agents, or at networks, or some combination thereof, in such a way as to optimize how you use technology to address some of these questions. Because sometimes you just throw technology at something and hope it sticks, and that's not a very good way of doing it. And sometimes you say, well, I want the maximum impact, but you say, hold on. Suppose you have something like a system dynamics model. In that case, as uh, Donella Meadows used to point out, some types of feedback loops, some types of uh, system dynamics connections have greater impact than others. And if you're not careful, you can overbalance these loops by saying, okay, I'll throw transformation at all of these loops with high impact, and you can completely overwhelm the system. And you would have been better saying, I'll use technology at the lower impact level, which tones down the volume, if you will, on these loops at the enhancement level, in other words, and I'll take some of the smaller loops and I'll throw the technology at the transformation, the ones, the loops that are sometimes less impactful of, on their own and amplify them using these particular uses of the technology. So again, this is one of the components we'll look at. And then, the other model I've developed is the model called the EdTech Quintet. It refers to five categories of technology, social tools, the tools we use to communicate with each other, to create jointly, to share what we create, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just noticed there was a uh, question on the audio. Can everybody still hear me? If you can, somebody can quickly. Okay, I see thumbs up, good. So the audio, sorry about that glitch. Uh, so then digital story, okay, so, Okay, so very briefly, let me rewind a little bit. I'll, again, so I'll just very briefly with the EdTech Quintet, social tools relate to the tools we use to communicate, other, share what we create, uh, in, engage in collaboration, cooperation projects with each other. Mobility tools refer to the fact that we can use the tools that we have anytime, any place. They're no longer tied to a wall. So my smartphone, my tablet can go anywhere with me. My laptop can go anywhere with me. Visualization tools take something that is an abstract concept, like say time or space, and allow me to render it in some two or three dimensional form as either a digital map or a digital timeline. Storytelling allows me to integrate concepts by telling stories about them. And in telling stories, I make meaning for somebody else, but I make meaning for myself. So storytelling is a meaning-making device by bringing together anything I can bring in in the digital domain, from stories told with just images, to digital comics, to digital video, etc. And finally, gaming. And gaming provides feedback loops. When I play a game, I'm driven by trying to beat the game, but a game provides me information on how well I'm doing, how much I'm how much I'm progressing in my understanding of whatever is represented in the game via feedback loops. So what that allows me to do is it gives me five tools that I can use for these types of purposes. And again, if you think about each of these, each of these relates to what we saw in those categories of system dynamics, agents, and networks 
in very direct ways because if we're talking, for instance, about communication collaboration, just to pick the most obvious one of the lot, those are the connections, those pipes, those are the connections, those connections between people in networks, etc. So each of these then can be used. And again, you can use it not just to say, oh, I, I kind of feel like having the students uh, make a digital video here. You can say, well, hold on. It's the integration of concepts that's involved in digital storytelling, an appropriate way of bringing together two things so as to make a particular structure anti-fragile. Uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but we can actually take it a step deeper and you can relate the five elements of the EdTech Quintet with the processes involved in a Vygotskyan social learning process. And for those of you who choose to engage with the next phase of the project, we're gonna be spending a fair bit of time on this. I'm just going to point out that each one of the five categories of the EdTech Quintet also relates to a fundamental category of Vygotskyan social learning. So for instance, social provides diversity, mobility creates a context for a social process of uh, Vygotskyan social learning. Then visualization allows you to chop up a zone of proximal development so you can pick out components that are gonna be part of your learning process. Storytelling integrates a zone of proximal development and gaming provides that loop of independent practice. Again, if you've not seen Vygotsky before this, don't worry, we'll spend plenty of time on this. But I also wanna point out that the EdTech Quintet also relates at this level to what you can or might do. So at this point, we're coming to a close. I want to make sure that I don't keep you too long today. You've all been very kind to be here this morning, and I want to honor your time and your other commitments. But now let me tell you what we're going to do next. What I've tried to do in this session is to give you the landscape. Why we're doing this? Why do we care about anti-fragility? Where do these three components, system dynamics, agents, and social networks all play into this? give you examples from actual educational practice, and then introduce you to two, two sets of tools, SAMR and the EdTech Quintet, that will help us design systematically towards the objectives we would like to achieve in anti-fragility when tackling a problem at the educational level. And again, I wanted to put these five questions here on screen so that you could have them in mind as I'm telling you the last bit of the story because the last bit of the story is actually the beginning of the next phase of the story. The beginning of the next phase of the story is that we're not going to just say, okay, and now Ruben is gonna give us some more lectures on this. No, that's not what's going to happen next. What's happening next is we're going to open the process for a design studio. We're going to invite you to join us in teams with a specific problem, not a hypothetical, not a let's play pretend. No, 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 no. I want you to identify a question that you're interested in, passionate about, saying, if we don't address this, my institution is headed straight for that you know, existential risk charter that you're concerned about because, for instance, as I know Brian, Brian Alexander is doing, you're very concerned about what's going to happen with the next range of uh, climate change, like uh, inspired or triggered, I should say rather, black swans. And what you want to do about this, so you actually want to deal with this. You want to create structures, you want to create frameworks, you want to create something that you're going to use, you want to create something that you can take back to an institution and say, hey, we need to be thinking in these ways. That's what we're going to be doing next. So the next thing that's going to happen is after you leave here today, you're going to get an email from us and it's going to be an invitation. And it's going to be an invitation to participate in an intensive design studio. Those of you who have worked in design studios know you don't lecture in a design studio. You work, you create, you make, and that's going to be the goal. I don't want to get an anti-fragility by having me preach at you for the next 50 hours on, and then here's another research. No, no, no. You're going to make something that's going to make something that's going to matter to you. So that means that you are going to be doing something different with anti-fragility from the next team next door. And that's important. It's also why, by the way, I'm doing this uh, session in three uh, different languages. So in English, uh, French, and Spanish, because I want to diversify a key element of uh, anti-fragility, okay? No matter how you're thinking, think about how to get different minds in the room, different approaches, how you get people to segment things differently. When people come in with their own language, 
from a background of different cultures, your bets are much better, much safer that you have a shot at doing this. So that's going to be the next stage. It's going to be an invitation for you to put together a small proposal and the team. And then we're going to be working intensively over the course of a week. And that's going to happen in the next month. And one of the reasons I'm not giving you a date is because I want this to work for you. Rather than saying, ah, you must be here on Tuesdays at eight o'clock Eastern. No, 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 no. This is a design workshop. I'm going to be working with you and your teams in the framework, in the time, in the form that works for you and your project. And that's going to be important. So that's going to be the next stage. As I say, you're going to get a nice little email from us with a little link to a form so as to uh, you know, submit your proposal. We're going to give you some time, some, you know, we need to have this information by this date, I think. But that's what you want to be thinking about. What type of project do you want to do? And I am saying specifically teams, because I think you get the most mileage if instead of working on your own, you work with other people. The more brains in the room up to a certain point, at some point you get too many brains in the room. And that's an interesting question. But, you know, if you can get two, three, four, up to seven, say, or so people in the room, that's great. But you have to decide. If you want to make a case for a team of one, in other words, you'll be talking to yourself in the mirror in the morning, make the case. I'm willing to listen. You'll make a case for a team of 800. Well, we're going to need to get a big Zoom account to host the conversations, but I'm willing to listen. But that's the key thing. This is going to be a design studio, not a set of lectures. It's going to be a hands-on make something. And what you make, we're going to compile. And the goal is not only are we going to have the use of it, but we're also going to create something that can be a resource for others, a resource that can lead to more anti-fragile thinking, more institutions figuring out how to deal with black swans, not just by subsisting, not just by hoping they don't get hit too hard by that black swan, but actually by flourishing, by coming out better, stronger, the other end. So my contact info as usual, I want to thank you all for your time. We've run a little bit longer than I had expected to, but that's okay. So I, as I say, I want to make sure that if you have any questions, uh, we can answer them. So feel free to go ahead and type into the chat. But uh, again, let me thank you all for coming. By the way, the slides will be available to you. The video will be available to you. We'll send you information on how to get those. But uh, let me ask you, are there any questions that we can address? So, so I noticed Paul is talking about zombie world and too many brains. Of course, we could do a whole project on zombie movies and uh, which ones take the best uh, use, make the best use of the brains they have, right? But that's another story for another time. So Marilyn, uh, can I explain more about the implicit network? Sure. Let me give you another example. This is one I, this is the one I was actually thinking of doing today, but as I say, I did a calculation of time. It was just going to take too long. Suppose I asked each of you to say, okay, you know what? We're all going to go out for dessert later today. And we're going to this ice cream store and they have all sorts of ice cream flavors. Uh, but, you know, so that uh, because it's going to take too long, we're just going to buy big buckets of ice cream and sherbet and toppings. And we're going to come back and we're going to make some of this. So I need to know your two top favorite flavors and your favorite topping. So I'm going to ask you three questions, one for the first flavor of the Sunday, one for the second flavor of the Sunday, and one for the top. And then I'm going to say, well, if you answered all three things, say the same as Paul, you and Paul have a strong connection. There's an implicit connection between the two of you by virtue of the Sunday. The Sunday just made an implicit connection between the two of you that's very, very strong. If on the other hand, you share only one flavor with Tom, Okay, so then you have a much weaker connection with Tom. And if, say, Stephanie shares no flavors or toppings with you, then I'm sorry to say you don't really belong to the same uh, dessert grouping for that table. So this is what I mean by implicit networks. You don't know each other perhaps prior to today. I know many of you actually do know each other, but pretend for a second you don't know each other. In your choice of which ice creams you prefer, there is an implicit network among you. Let me give you an example from academia. Students take courses, and let's assume they're in uh, either a high school where there is choice for courses or a college. If you look at the courses that students have in common, that they've chosen in common, there's an implicit network 
among those students. I'm not talking about the ones that everybody has to take English 101 or whatever it is. That doesn't tell you anything. Everybody has to take it. But suppose you're looking at all the students that chose to take, I don't know, Beowulf, okay, in English literature, and all the students that chose uh, to take uh, differential equations 201, and all the students that chose to take uh, build your own robot in robotics, whatever it is. Again, the more courses two students have in common, the closer they are, or the more tightly they are linked within an implicit network. And again, that's information you have. You have your registration lists. You can do things with that. You can say, oh my God, I have a problem. Which areas of the institution need bolstering? Where are students getting sort of cut off from the rest? This implicit network data can help you set up a design process by which you're going to come up with anti-fragile solutions to address that question. So that's another example of an implicit network. In other words, it's the cases where an explicit network is, I know you, you're my friend, I talk with you, you talk with me. We have a very explicit connection there. This is implicit. We didn't know each other, but by virtue of the courses we took, there's an implicit connection between us. So other questions or comments? I'm looking here in the sidebar. Let's see. Thank you. Well, thank you to everybody who's saying thank you. Uh, Julieta, me alegro mucho de haber disfrutado el webinar. Muchas gracias. Uh, okay, so, all right. So it looks like uh, questions have been largely addressed. So again, please look for the email. Please look for that invitation because I really want to work with all of you. I really want to see what you're going to make because I, I think this is, you know, this is the point at which the design process for thinking about anti-fragility can make wonderful new things that will help you, of course, but that I think all working together, we can help others as well, again, deal with a very complex universe of black swans. All right. So with that in mind, then let me thank you all for coming. It's been wonderful to see you and I hope to see you all, or at least as many of you as would like to come play in the design studio.